This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you very much for your uh, introduction, Dr. Butler, and thank you for the opportunity today to describe some of our adventures of using molecular tools at the Corvallis Gene Bank. Much of what we do at the repository is the result of uh, collaborations that are wide. Um, they involve our team at the National Clonal, Clonal Germplasm Repository in Corvallis with our curators, Kim Hammer and Joseph Kostman, and a group of um, uh, Jason Zern and Jill Bouchakra uh, who, are, who are postdocs with us. Uh, visiting scientist K, uh, Dale Kim, uh, many students and technicians. Uh, we collaborate with many of our colleagues with the USDA RS at the Forage Seed um, and Cereal Research Facility, John Henning, who's a, a breeder, hop breeder, uh, at the Horticultural Crop Research Unit, Chad Finn, who, um, late Chad Finn, who is a small fruit breeder, Jungmin Lee, uh, who conducts fruit analyses, um, Richard Bell, John Norelli from the Appalachian Fruit Lab, uh, breeder and pathologist, Lisa Rowland uh, from the Genetic Improvement for Fruits and Vegetables, uh, BC Berry Cultivar Development, Michael Dossett, who did his master's and PhD in Corvallis. Um, the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center, Todd Mockler and Doug uh, Bryant, who worked with us on developing the black raspberry genome. And many collaborators at universities like the University of Florida, Vance Whitaker, Song Hee Lee and Paul Lyrene. Oregon State University, Kelly Vining, Christina Mulch, who's a student now, and uh, phylogenomicist Aaron Liston, North Carolina State University, Hamid Ashrafi, Rishi Arial, Massimo Yorizzo, who leads the VACAP, a CRI funded project, UC Davis, Sarah Montanari, David Neal, and Michael Hardigan, and Larry Alice at Western Kentucky University. This list is definitely not um, comprehensive and I really hope I'm not forgetting anyone. I'm just, I just tried to list the people who contributed to the work I'm describing today. The Corvallis repository is one of the eight clonal repositories in the National Plant Germplasm System. And it's where this red dot is in Oregon. Um, our federal facilities and most of our farm are located on Oregon State University ground, which is located within the traditional homelands of the Mary's River or Ampinifu Band of Kalapuya. Following the Willamette Valley Treaty of 1855, the Kalapuya people were forcibly removed to reservations in Western Oregon, where their descendants now reside. And we'd like, we are very grateful for their um, sacrifice. Currently, our, um, our collection contains about 13,000 accessions from 73 genera um, that consist of mostly eight major genera and their wild relatives. We are responsible for preserving hazelnut, coralus, strawberry, fragaria, hops, humulus, mint, pear, currants and gooseberries, blackberries and raspberries, and blueberries and uh, cranberries. And our collections range in size from about 500 in mint to over 2300 in pear. We are very, very passionate about our mission of supporting agricultural production by acquiring, conserving, evaluating and characterizing, documenting and freely distributing our germplasm. Um, as I said, our uh, crops are clonally propagated and our primary collections of non-tree fruits are preserved, maintained and 
screen houses to protect them from insect vectored viruses. You see here the Fragaria collection on the left and the Rubus collection on the right. You see they are maintained in pots in screen houses. And they are not allowed to flower or fruit to maintain their genetic integrity. And as you can see here, they're really difficult to distinguish morphologically and to keep them in a vigorous state and able to produce the propagules we distribute, they are propagated on a cycle, depending on the genus, three, six, or 10 year cycles, which is a process that is error prone. And our three collections, the pear and hazelnuts, are maintained in orchards in the field. And a subset of our blueberry collection is also maintained in the field, in addition to this greenhouse. As Dr. Buckler mentioned, the molecular lab was established in September 2002 when I was hired. Now that I've given you a little bit of a background on the germplasm repository, I thought today that I would like to give you um, uh, a little bit of uh, examples on how characterizing genetic resources at the repository, at the repository uh, allowed us to confirm identity, uh, reconstruct pedigree, establish a core, determine phylogenetic relationship, validate associations of markers with uh, important traits and provided opportunities for genome-wide association studies. We've been able to identify genomic regions associated with important traits. And I wanted to uh, tell you one of my favorite stories that covers acquiring germplasm all the way to using it in um, developing cultivars that meet the industry needs and end with current approaches of uh, DNA characterization right now, what we're thinking. So starting with examples of uh, identity confirmation, as I said, our blueberry collection is in the field and in greenhouses. The field collection, we see the fruits and that enables us to do phenotype the fruits and host open houses for the public so they can enjoy the diversity of the blueberry collection. And then our greenhouse collection is the one that we use for, um, for uh, getting propagules and, and distributing uh, from our accession. So it's very important for us um, to, to assess whether the, the plants, four or five plants representing each of these accessions are the same genotype. As we've done for most of our uh, major genera, We've developed a multiplexed fingerprinting sets of long core repeat, simple sequence repeats. Uh, in Blueberry, it's made up of 10 SSRs, as you can see here in uh, Pioneer uh, Blueberry. So in this study, um, we genotyped with this fingerprinting set over 360 plants representing Hundred the most uh, requested accessions, 140 accessions. They were mostly from the germplasm repository. And we also included some of the cultivars uh, that we obtained from the breeders. That allowed us to, uh, we use parentage analysis to confirm identity. And we proposed the following ontology to categorize these accessions. So true to type is where um, the parentage analysis confirmed that these uh, accessions are true to type. Identity okay, where we had allele composition for only one of the parents and it agreed and the morphology of the plant agreed with the cultivar, but we'd like more information to move it to true to type. We've had some that are identity in question where the allele composition did not match the reported parentage and wrong identity where the morphology and the allele compositions did not agree and the plants were discarded. So right now we have a student that is working on resolving the IDQ and ID question issues in Blueberry 
and replacing these accessions with true to type accessions. One of the uh, accessions that we were able to determine as true to type through parentage analysis is Florida 4B. According to breeder Paul Lyrene, almost all Southern highbush cultivars trace back to this single clone, Florida 4B, that was collected in 1949 by Ralph Sharp at Winter Haven, Florida. So we had two genotypes for Florida 4B, 1790 and Florida 4B, uh, the other Florida 4B. And um, through parentage analysis, you can see here that the 1790 contributed its alleles 180 and 231 at these two SSRs to the offspring US 75. Uh, confirming that it is the, the reported Floria 4B. And uh, population structure analyses of uh, collections of Vaccinium Eliotii, Vaccinium Fuscatum, and Vaccinium Darawai that were collected in Florida uh, and included this Florida 4B accession 1790, uh, identified it as a hybrid between Vaccinium darawai and Vaccinium fuscatum that are being used in breeding highbush blueberry. Another story of confirming identity is that of the boysenberry that you might have heard of. Boysenberry was developed in the 1920s by Rudolf Boysen, a hobbyist breeder. Here you can see his wife, Grandma Peggy, uh, eating boysenberry. Um, and we obtained this uh, picture of her from her granddaughter, Janet Boysen Fitzgerald. So at the time before the study, we did not know the pedigree of Boysenberry, but it was believed to be the result of a cross between Logan and an unknown trailing Blackberry. Um, um, variants of Boysen believed to be sports have been industry standards during ver various points in history. The three most important ones were Boysen 43, that's been an Oregon industry strand standard in the 1990s and believed to be um, used in the breeding program of the USDA ARS in Corvallis, Oregon. Another, um, another variant is Riwaka's choice that was selected in New Zealand and Nectarberry. So in this study, we used our BlackBerry fingerprinting set to genotype accessions of boysenberry and their variants and potential parents. We obtained them from four nurseries, three private farms, including that of Janet Boysen Fitzgerald, the granddaughter of Rudolf Boysen who developed it, from the National Clean Plant Network and from the USDARS breeding program in Corvallis and the repository. As you can see, we ended up with five different genotypes of boysenberry that are different. Um, we were using parentage analysis, we were able to determine that this boysenberry here from uh, the private farm of Janet Boysen Fitzgerald um, that matched that of Thornless Boysen from a nursery and another boysenberry from um, another private farm in California appear to be the result of Logan by Austin Mays. And uh, clonal variants that were believed to be clonal variants are actually offsprings of boysenberry. And multiple genotypes are being sold by nurseries under boysenberry. You can see here the same nursery where the red uh, uh, arrow is, the same nectar boysenberry obtained in 2012 and 2018 had totally different fingerprints. So different genotypes are being sold under the same name for boysenberry. Another, uh, uh, another project, the East Coast Hops project was established in 2012 uh, at the University of, as a collaboration between the Unis University of Maryland and a Flying Dog Brewery uh, and it's led by Brian Butler, an extension agent. Uh, following an article in the Smithsonian describing this collaboration to identify hop uh, accessions or cultivars that are suitable for 
the mid-Atlantic uh, region and that can be used to brew local, um, local beer, uh, some uh, farmers or um, local people uh, gave Brian Butler uh, accessions that do well and that are believed to have been there for over a hundred years in that region. And Brian Butler was desperate to know what, whether these accessions are unique. So we were in the process of using our hop fingerprinting set to genotype all of our collection as well uh, as a few hundred accessions from the breeding program of John Henning in Corvallis. And we were able to determine that unknown one um, that matched that of Centennial a cultivar that was bred in 1974 and released by Washington State University in 1990. While the second unknown, um, you can't read this, but um, the gray here is unknown too. It grouped with wild North American accessions and appears to be unique. And University of Maryland owns the rights to it and plans to release it to brew local beer. Moving on to uh, stories of pedigree reconstruction. I start with a story of old home by Farmingdale rootstocks that are still being used at rootstocks currently. Uh, old home and farming, Farmingdale are two very fire blight resistant pear cultivars that Professor Frank Reimer uh, from Oregon State University obtained in 1915 from uh, ben Benjamin Buckman in Farmingdale, Illinois. Old home has worthless fruit, but is graft compatible with quince. And Professor Frank Reimer um, found it to be very useful for producing blight resistant uh, offspring, uh, particularly with uh, Farmingdale. Um, and at the time Farmingdale was thought to be a seedling of Anjou one of the more blight resistant European cultivars. Uh, in 2000, the repository maintains 41 of these Old Home by Farmingdale selections. Uh, the ones that we maintain are ones that were um, released um, in the later 1990s. A lot of studies were done um, on a collection of seedlings that Brook Lyle in 1952 obtained from Frank Reimer from an old home orchard that had Farmingdale as a pollinizer. So um, about half kilogram of seeds were obtained and these were further uh, evaluated uh, for rootstock uh, desirable traits such as ability to propagate from hardwood cuttings, fire blight resistant most importantly, and then sizing. Um, so in 2009, when we, uh, when we genotyped six of these Old Home by Farmingdale clones, we found that Farmingdale could not be the parent of these Old Home by Farmingdale rootstocks, but Bartlett is. And then Anjou is likely the, the parent of Farmingdale. And, um, uh, these findings were uh, confirmed using uh, SNP data that was developed in 2020 for all 40 um, uh, selections. The majority were the result of a cross between Old Home by Bartlett, except for two that were the result of a cross between Old Home by Anjou. Um, so uh, in 2019, 2020, um, Sarah Montaneri, who was at UC Davis at the time, led the development of a 70K SNP array for pair. And we used it to evaluate, um, evaluate over 1600, to genotype over 1600 accessions from the repository. And we found only 1113 of them had a unique genotype and 534 of the trees belong to uh, 208 sets of duplicates, 54 of which were previously unknown. Right now, we are uh, looking to evaluate them phenotypically, particularly for fruit traits, 
to confirm that they are actually duplicates and there was no error in sampling or genotyping. Um, the study allowed us to reconstruct pedigree from 139 trios and confirm their pedigree, but uh, 498 were newly identified we didn't know about at all. I only talk about white doyenne that originated in 1652 and is a, is a very important founder. It's parent of 56 accessions, including the uh, most commonly planted Bartlett or uh, William Bon Chrétien, and also Anjou, two of the very important cultivars currently being grown. Bartlett, uh, that is found in Berkshire in 1770, it has been heavily used in breeding and it's parent of 156 of the accessions that were included in that study, including Club Favorite and Kiefer, a hybrid between European and Asian pair. Um, the late Chad Finn, um, ever since we developed fingerprinting sets for uh, a lot, many of our crops like Blackberry here, we started uh, confirming parentage of his releases. Um, and Eclipse is one of the uh, cultivars that he released. Um, it's a semi-erect, um, semi-erect uh, blackberry with uniform dark fruits. Um, and it ripens in relatively early in the semi-erect uh, season. It was selected in 2004 from a cross made in 2001, and it was believed to be the result of a cross between a selection Aorus 1393-1 and Triple Crown. When we did parentage analysis on Eclipse, we found that it, cannot, it had alleles that were not present in either of these parents. So then Chad and his technician, Mary, looked through the records and uh, found a note about the possibility of another selection, or is 1392-1 being a parent. So 1392-1 is not available anymore, but the repository has its parents, Eni Hardy and Chester Thornless. And when these were used in parentage analysis, we found that sure enough, 1392-1 by triple crown are the actual parents of Eclipse. Moving on to establishing core collections. Um, it's a concept that was introduced in the late 1980s to increase the efficiency of characterization and utilization of collections stored in gene banks while preserving as much as possible of the diversity of the entire collection. So core collections have been formed for each of our major uh, genera uh, based on key morphological traits and geographical origin of the cultivar releases. And these uh, core collections were formed in a collaborative effort between the curator of each collection and the corresponding crop germplasm committee. In strawberry 323, of the cultivated strawberry Fragaria ananasa uh, make up the core collection. In 2013, Odong described um, different types of core collections, uh, CCI that represents the diversity of the collection, CCX that represents the extremes in the collection, extremes of the trait, and then CCD that uh, represents the distribution of the accessions in the collection. And he um, developed quality criteria for making sure um, these collections, uh, so for being able to assess the quality of these collection, core collections. So using SNP data of our entire Fragaria ananasa cultivated strawberry collection of 539 accessions, uh, that were generated uh, from genotyping with the 35K array uh, that we developed and the 50K array developed by Steve Knapp's group, we were able to develop a CCX core 
and CCI core using a seed 13 accessions that we determined uh, as positive and negative controls for some of the DNA tests we were we applied to them. So jointly, the CCI CCX uh, 178 accessions from these two cores are way less than the 323 core that was determined uh, using morphological traits and locality data. And that enables us to, um, to more efficiently conserve our resources and being able to uh, propagate 178 accessions for characterizing is a lot easier than propagating 323 accessions. Um, germplasm repositories are ideal for phylogenetic analysis as they hold the domesticated um, species as well as their wild relatives. And in Fragaria, we have a large collection of Fragaria ananasa, the, the octoploid uh, cultivated strawberry, as well as most of its uh, relatives that are diploid, tetraploid, um, as hexaploid, we have one hexaploid, and decaploid. So um, in this study, we um, sequenced chloroplasts and used them uh, to, for phylogenetic analyses. Um, and here we illustrate Bayesian relationships of these uh, chloroplast sequences. Uh, you can see that it resolved them into two well-supported clade A and C. Uh, and also based on runnering into monopodial and sympodial runnering mostly. And then um, in clade A, within clade A, you can see that uh, Vesca is not monophyletic. Fragaria Vesca is a diploid uh, strawberry, is not monophyletic. Here you can see the Americana Vesca, subspecies Americana, as well as the uh, subspe subspecies Vesca. And Subspecies Bracteata, the diploid Bracteata that is native uh, to the Cascades, uh, to the Pacific and the uh, Cascade ranges of North America from British Columbia to California, um, is closely related to the uh, octoploid progenitors of Fragaria ananasa, Fragaria virginiana, and Fragaria chilewensis, and to the native a uh, hybrid between those two, as well as to the decaploid etrupensis. And Fragaria vesca subspecies Bracteata then is the donor of the chloroplast genome to the octoploid clade. Um, another study uh, of phylogeny using mostly accessions from the repository is that of Rubus. Rubus is a very complex genus that contains over 500 species. And in the early 1900s, Hawke um, classified it or divide, divided it into 12 subgenera. Um, in 1999, uh, there was a phylogeny, phylogenetic analysis by Larry Alice, who collaborated on this work here um, using ITS regions. And so in this study, we used target capture of about a thousand single copy genes uh, of rubus and chloroplast uh, sequences for phylogenetic analysis. And uh, all the different phylogenetic analysis um, agreed on grouping on, on eight groups uh, of these accessions that, that are representatives of all 12 subgenera. The only monophyletic subgenera were Orobatus um, here and uh, Anoplobatus in clade two. And Rubus was mostly mono, uh, monophyletic, but uh, Rubus is the subgenus that has all the blackberries. Idiobatus has the raspberries and is polyphyletic and has members in five different clades. Clade five contains closely related Asian polyploid species from five different uh, subgenera. 
So subgeneric classifications do not reflect phylogenetic relationships and need further work. The uh, accessions at the repository where phenotypic um, data is available are uh, ideal for validating uh, markers associated with those traits and um, uh, supported by the SCRI funded Rosebreed project, we were able to validate some of these DNA tests for perpetual flowering here. And then um, fruit quality traits like uh, gamma decalactone and mesofuran here. And then for disease resistant traits uh, like uh, crown rot, uh, bacterial spot, and then anthracnose resistance. And we were able to establish uh, accessions that are positive and negative controls for these DNA tests. All of this is described in a DNA testing handbook that we've established in 2019 and updated in 2021 in collaboration with Songhee Lee and Vance Whitaker's group at uh, University of Florida. So this DNA testing handbook is available um, on the genome database for the Rosaceae website. And then all of these accessions, positive and negative controls are available from the repository. Um, moving on to pair with funding from the, again, Rose Breed, we uh, were able to, um, to identify um, chromosome two, uh, a chromosome two region, as controlling fire blight resistance in three families that were developed in, uh, by the breeder in Kernisville, USDARS in Kernisville, from three different sources, Old Home, Potomac, and an NJ accession. So this chromosome two region was also previously found to control fire blight resistance. Uh, we went on further to sequence the genes in this region from resistant and susceptible parents and some progeny and identified bases that are associated with uh, resistance, particularly in um, disease resistance genes. We are right now in the process of using SeekSNP to uh, confirm association um, of these bases by genotyping them in accessions that are known to be resistant and susceptible uh, from the repository and uh, also from colleagues in Kernisville and in New Zealand. And our objective here is to develop easy and cost-effective DNA tests that can predict fire blight uh, resistance. Uh, as I said, having a collection in the field and being able to observe the fruit, fruits uh, provide opportunities for genome-wide associations. And we are um, using that in Blueberry. We're phenotyping them uh, for fruit texture traits in collaboration uh, with uh, Massimo Yorizzo, who leads the VACAP, and fruit quality traits too in collaboration again, with Massimo, as well as uh, Ashrafi's group, and also for bioavailability. Uh, some of these were genotyped with the 30K target capture um, from Rapid Genomics, and uh, they will also be genotyped with a 20K target capture uh, platform that we are developing in the VACCAP. I'm in charge of developing this uh, 20K FlexSeq EXL platform. And my favorite story of acquiring germplasm to uh, using them in breeding. So the challenge for the black raspberry industry has been that black raspberry plants die three to four years after planting them due to a black uh, raspberry necrosis virus complex that is vectored by the North American large raspberry aphid. So um, Michael Dossett was a master student at the time. Uh, he and Chad Finn and the curator Kim Hummer for Black Raspberry 
they themselves collected and obtained seed from 27 um, US states and two Canadian provinces that are in the native range of um, black raspberry. They subsequently germinated these seedlings and screened them for, screened them for aphid resistance in 2007 and 2008, and identified three uh, sources of resistance, one from Ontario, Canada, one from Michigan, and one from Maine. They then subsequently established three populations and determined that a single gene uh, is responsible for each of the three sources. Funding from the Specialty Crop Research Initiative allowed us to map these three sources to three separate but linked loci on rubus linkage group six and to identify one marker, um, HRM or uh, SS, uh, high resolution melting or simple sequence repeat that identifies resistance irrespective of the source we now routinely use this HRM marker to screen seedlings each year for resistance or susceptibility. And only the resistant seedlings are planted in the field and evaluated further for other traits. And uh, we are collaborating with uh, Christina Maltz, who's a master's student, and Kelly Vining on using differential expression profiling of resistant versus susceptible uh, seedlings pre and 12 hours post inoculation with aphid for each of these three different sources for three different for three new populations to find a map to identify the candidates that are associated with resistance and then subsequently uh, uh, map saturate rubus language group six and develop markers that are specific for each of these sources of resistance so that we can pyramid these sources and use use um, and, and ensure durable resistance. So um, our current approach to molecular characterization at the Corvallis Gene Bank <laughs> consists of collaborating with anybody who'd like to collaborate with us. Um, we're thinking that for identity confirmation, given that we've developed fingerprinting sets and we have existing databases, we'll continue using um, SSR-based fingerprinting sets when we have uh, a, qu a question for a small number of accessions. We are also um, developing CASP assays for uh, some of our crops. We have one for hop. We uh, have started one for blueberry and red raspberry. So when we have a large number of samples to assay, we think it's more economical to use CASP. And now that Breeding Insight is developing dart tag in blueberry and uh, strawberry, we'd like to test dart tag uh, for different studies where we need um, a medium number of markers. For GWAS, we like to collaborate. For our field collections, we like to collaborate on phenotyping our collections. And then for our greenhouse and greenhouse collections, we're always happy to propagate and collaborate on phenotyping and genotyping, what we have in the collection. And then I'd like to leave you with a take home message of Molecular characterization of genetic resources is really a collaborative effort that requires different expertises. And then the NCGR diverse collections provide many, many opportunities for many different studies. Uh, our long core SSR fingerprinting sets are available for most of our crops and they are quite useful for identity confirmation for, uh, you know, small number of samples mostly. And then the SNP platforms are cost effective uh, when dealing with a large number of samples in multiples of 96. Um, we believe that CASP assays are economic and fast and they're becoming available in our crops. And we'd like to continue uh, collaborating on uh, genome-wide association studies 
and we welcome collaborations on, on these. And I'd like to acknowledge funding from many different sources, and they include Specialty Crop Research Initiative, NIFA grants, Rosebreed, VACCAP, and one for uh, Black Raspberry, the National Plan Germplasm System Evaluation Grants, and uh, many different organizations like the California Pear Advisory Board, Brewers Association, Northwest Center for Small Fruit Research, uh, Oregon Raspberries and Blackberries, uh, Western Kentucky University, NARBA, the Washington Tree Fruit Research Commission, and of course, our Chris. And thank you so much for your attention and um, welcome your questions. We have about five minutes or so for questions. Has the rate of collection and addition of germplasm to the repository uh, continued to increase or is there a trade-off with the molecular characterization that you have to do? No, it, it continues to increase. Slowly, you know, there are countries from which we cannot get uh, accessions. And then, of course, we haven't had explorations the last two years because of COVID, but they do continue to increase. And really, the molecular lab is, you know, it's only me and right now one technician. We don't have, uh, it's three scientists at the repository, two curators and me. So Naila, I, I thought the, your pedigree uh, validation was really excellent to see the proportions where people were getting things right and, and everything. But you had that identity okay at, at 54%. Um, how many of those do you think are gonna validate out either being truly fully correct or with more investigation are gonna, you know, they only got one parent right. You know, the, the father wasn't yes. correct. Yeah. You know, I think the majority will be right because also, um, you know, we have breeders that come and look at the phenotype and compare it to what is in the literature and they say it mostly fits. So we don't want to put them as true to type yet until we confirm through uh, pedigree analysis whether, yeah, whether they are true to type. So we have one from the chat uh, from Connor. How do you see the bioinformatics techniques for this kind of work developing or changing in the future? Well, we really, really need bioinformatics support. And uh, we've had some over the years. Right now, we don't have any. Um, I had a bioinformaticist who just went on to do um, her PhD right now. But we'll be seeking. Right now, we're advertising for a postdoc who would have some bioinformatics support. Yeah, definitely. We need uh, bioinformatics. Yeah, so now one other question, you know, on the release, uh, the clips released from, uh, from Chad, how yes. frequently do you yes. think the varieties we actually release actually have their pedigree messed up? You know, I, oh, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> This is something we only started the last few years with Chad. And um, out of the, I would say, maybe six or so that we evaluated, only one was messed up. So, <laughs> I, so you have to have higher numbers to give a percent. I cannot give a percent. Right. 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 Uh, I was wondering if there's some kind of jackpot thing that uh, actually the ones we release you know, sometimes we've made more mistakes than everything else, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I can't say that. No, okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so we've got a couple more in the chat here. Just comments for apples. There are a few well-known cultivars that were misidentified in the germplasm collection. These are now being sold by the nursery industry, which further complicates the situation. Is there a similar situation for the crops you work with? And yes. if so, how have you dealt with the situation with the nursery industry? That's from Greg Peck. Yes, uh, we see that. Um, you know, in blueberry, as you saw, there were 15% misidentified. In strawberry, we're finding about 20% misidentified. Now, with regards to nurseries, um, we've tested in 
some in black raspberry we've tested as you saw in boysenberry and you have different names different genotypes um, or the same name for different genotypes so um, that is common it looks like it it i shouldn't say common it does happen um, we present at a commission we, pre we we present our findings and we talk to nurseries about it but um, that's the extent to which we do that but we want to ensure that what we have is true to type and is confirmed as true to type yeah we have another um question from geneva moira sheehan uh excellent talk nyla appreciated seeing the diversity of species you're working on do you notice some species that have higher rates of soma clonal variation than others you know, I noticed some accessions having a high, high rate, you know, like Bartlett. We have a lot of Bartlett clones. So in pair, we have Bartlett clones. We have, um, what else? I'm trying to think of other examples. Um, I think it's, it's uh, genotype specific, Moira. Also in Blueberry, we found some uh, blueberry accessions that are prone to soma clonal variation in tissue culture. One of them, uh, I know we genotyped for a nursery and were able to detect the variation and they stopped selling that. I don't want to say which cultivar that is, but we've seen that more. Uh, I think it's more uh, cultivar specific or accession specific. Uh, any other questions? Nayla, it's been fantastic having you. Thank you so very much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.